The scene might almost be the eve of the Battle of Waterloo. The men in their scarlet dress uniforms, the ladies' hair falling in ringlets to their shoulders. In fact, this is November 1968, a popular dance hall hired for the night in the garrison town of Plymouth. The sergeants of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders are entertaining the officers and their wives for the annual Balaclava Ball. Guest of honor, the commanding officer, Colonel Sandy Boswell, is piped to his table. No other infantry regiment in the British Army can claim Balaclava among its battle honors. They were the immortal Thin Red Line, the most celebrated action the British infantry have ever fought. Silence, please, for the regimental sergeant major. I should like you now to just pause for a moment and think back 140 years to 1854, the stalwarts of the old 93rd Highlanders who made this ball possible. And as I plunge this dirk into this cake, I should like you to think of the way that they cut off the old Russian Imperial uh, cavalry, the old 93rd. And I might add the icing is as tough as the Argyle. <laughs> But even while they celebrate their famous victory of a century ago, the Argyles stand on the edge of oblivion. This famous regiment is at last to be destroyed, not by the enemy, but in a way which it is almost harder to bear. They have been told that they are no longer needed. The government have ordered them to disband. Within two years, they may be gone forever. Serving soldiers must keep their mouths shut, but others need not. As soon as the announcement was made public, a great campaign to save the Argyles got underway. General Sir Gordon Macmillan, hereditary chief of the clan Macmillan, the most distinguished living Argyle, came out of retirement and took his place once more at the head of his troops. The objective? A petition of a million signatures. A tiny group of elderly ex-officers gathered them in, like the names of a volunteer army prepared to march on Westminster. Right. They had no experience of modern press even less than tape. But in his younger days, General Macmillan won the MC three times over in the mud of Flanders before anyone could stop him. Meanwhile, the Argyles went off to Cyprus, feeling the southern sun on their backs, possibly for the last time. They have vivid memories of hunting Colonel Grievous in the mountains, when the main street of Nicosia was known as Murder Mile. All that remains now is a handover to the Welsh Guards, and one last exercise in those brown, familiar hills. The next thing you'll be doing on this little exercise is that you will be flushing some terrorists who've been located in a hide in one of the caves just below the skyline, up there. Now, you would normally do this by night. But for the practice, you'll be doing it in daylight first time round to see how it feels. Ready? OK, let's go. Flashing terrorists from a cave, an ambush in the dense and swampy jungles of Borneo, these are some of the dirtier aspects of war that the Argyles have grown accustomed to. In Palestine, Cyprus, Borneo and Aden, they have lived in daily contact with the booby trap, the sniper's bullet, the grenade in the night, all the sordid and petty incidents that confront the soldier when a great empire is in slow and painful retreat. Only 50 years ago, the Highlander soldier still lived and fought in his kilt. If he had to cross a river, it floated up round his neck, and when it froze, it cut his knees as he ran.
experience has taught the Argyles on occasion to be as tough and vicious as their adversaries. Right, Stuart Simpson, in there, clear that cave. Get these two guys up against the wall and get them searched. Braddock, you cover them. Search and call Mitchell Braddock's covering you, OK? More than once, travelling politicians have accused them of overdoing the rough stuff. They have never proved their point. Try to get a move. He's not, he's not a friend. Get on with him. Yeah. OK, leave it there. That's enough. Finish. Light up, have a smoke. Have a puff, a blow. It's over. OK. When you get back to the camp, I'll buy all the stims. Dude, keep me up now. Beer. <laughs> like the Roman legions before them, the Argyles are going home. The people of Cyprus have seen many a conquering army come and go. If this is the last moment the regimental flag flutters over their soil, it is a matter of indifference to them. Hold your head up, Murray. Hold your head up. You get your hair cut, the wooden tubes are heavy. Why should such a tough and experienced battalion be chosen for the axe, whilst other units are known to be short of recruits and battle experience? The answer is the Argyles must go because they are the junior Highland Regiment, a mere 175 years old. But there was one other choice before the Council of Highland Colonels who had to make the initial decision. The possibility of amalgamation with another Highland regiment, the Black Watch perhaps, or the Gordons. Uh, there is no doubt at all that amalgamation would have saved their guiles. Colonel Tommy Lamb. And I think uh, it's fair to say the, the Ministry of Defence uh, take a bit of a caning always over this type of thing, and they are blamed where blame isn't really in their court. I believe that if we in the Council of Highland Colonels had decided to, that two regiments would amalgamate, then this would have been welcomed in the ministry, and this was how it would have been done. There are no shotgun marriages in amalgamations. Both sides have got to agree. General Freddie Graham. Now, remembering that juniority was the criterion, why should, if we were likely to go, why should any other regiment wish to amalgamate with us when they thought they were probably sitting pretty? Juniority... Uh, General Macmillan. In the first place, uh, is quite wrong, uh, because it, it, may, it takes no account uh, of efficiency or record or anything of that kind at all. Uh, and in business, uh, I don't think you would agree with me, this wouldn't be tolerated as a way to reduce one's staff, uh, or uh, uh, just uh, because uh, uh, a chap is the, the last joined, he might be the most brilliant person in the whole outfit. But it is very difficult to see an alternative. Uh, and Mr. Boyden did uh, speak in the House in July this year, and as he so rightly said, you cannot really run a league table on the valour of a regiment. You can't really say, uh, looking through history, that one regiment is more efficient than the other. You cannot really go in recruiting figures, because they're very variable year by year. If you haven't got the guts to take a decision, like deciding whether one regiment is better than another, then you shouldn't be in charge of defence matters. Colin Mitchell. Uh, juniority, anyway, is a ridiculous term when you're talking about regiments which were formed in the 17th century. Uh, I have got an extremely good historical argument, which uh, I know a lot of you um, have followed before, and that is that the origins of the Argan Southern Highlanders, in fact, are 50 years earlier than the senior Highland Regiment. The, the, uh, the Earl of Argyle's regiment was formed in 1689, uh, and in fact, it was a company of the Earl of Argyle's regiment that carried out that famous massacre of Glencoe. Glencoe. One bitter February in 1692, a detachment of the Earl of Argyle's militia suddenly set upon their hosts, the Macdonalds. The old chief McKeon was shot dead in his nightshirt. His wife was stripped naked and pushed out into the blizzard. Altogether, 38 men, women and children were bayoneted in their beds or dragged outside to be shot. Some were burned alive in their cottages. The blood that was shed that day has never been forgotten in the Highlands. The Campbells of Argyle had reason enough to avenge themselves on the McDonalds. They had suffered many bloody raids by the men of Glencoe. But 
this had been different. This time, the Earl of Argyll's men were acting as instruments of the English crown. Twice in the next 50 years, the Highlands rose against the House of Hanover, and each time the Campbells fought on the English side. The end came here on Culloden Moor, the last great battle ever fought on British soil. The Highland cause never recovered from the bloody rout of Culloden. A line of powerful forts was developed right across the country. Fort William, Fort Augustus and Fort George dominating the Murray Firth. To the south of it, the Argyle Campbells became the most powerful and by some the most hated clan in Scotland. It was a bitter time. The kilt was outlawed and a new breed of landowners quickly discovered that sheep were more profitable than people. Thousands emigrated and for the young men who stayed there was often only one other choice. The British Army was looking for new recruits. It has been looking for them ever since. What better way to harness all that warlike spirit than by turning the Highlands into a reservoir of blood to serve the English crown? The loyal Argyles were entrusted with the task of raising one of the new regiments, and ever since, the Western Highlands have been their traditional recruiting area. But as the mountain population dwindled more and more, the search for recruits has shifted to the industrial areas further south. The Argyles' own pop group, the Glen G's, with hair carefully styled for hiding under a Glen Gary when the Sergeant Major's about. The modern soldier needs short back and sides on parade, but long hair in the evening if he's going to get his girl. There's no better recruiting technique than this. A year ago, these young Argyles were youth club boys themselves from Clydebank, Dumbarton, Paisley, and Glasgow. Whatever they think you're worth, if you're not a good soldier, well, they'll just stay that bit, and that's the... But competition is stiff. The Argyles can't offer a trade like the Remy or the Signals, just the glamour of a famous name. And that, too, may soon be gone. How do you explain to kids like these that the army still needs them, when one by one the old regimental names are disappearing? The Cameronians, the Highland Light Infantry, the Royal Scots Fusiliers, all from Scotland's west coast, have gone already. But with stubborn obstinacy, the Argyles keep on recruiting as hard and successfully as ever. In the morning mist, Robert the Bruce looks out from Stirling Castle, ancient seat of Scottish kings. Six battles have been fought within sight of these walls. Twice the rebellious Highland armies passed this way, and each time the Campbells opposed them. The Argyle Highlanders, the 91st Regiment of Foot, were raised at Stirling in 1794, and the castle is still the regimental headquarters today. Beneath a portrait of Princess Louise, the present colonel of the regiment, General Freddie Graham, meets a batch of new recruits. Now then, I like to see all squads of recruits coming into the regiment for two reasons. One, that uh, you should get a good look at me and know who I am. And secondly, that I should have a look at you I can't remember all your names, naturally, 
out of 650 odd men, but I'll know that we've met before. Uh, the reason that I, I think you ought to know who I am is that I am the Colonel of the Regiment, and as such, I'm responsible for seeing that all your traditions and your customs and your well-being as our guiles is, is kept up. Banqueting Hall, the pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war. The Argyles amalgamated in 1881, and the Argyles then were the 91st Argyleshire Highlanders and the 93rd Sutherland Highlanders. They were diametrically opposed because the 91st were all Campbells, and the 93rd were all Greys, Sutherlands, Mackays, Canes, and so on, the traditional enemies of the Campbells. It took 50 years, at least, for that amalgamation to begin to be a success. After centuries of clan turmoil, the wild boar of Argyle and the wild cat of Sutherland share the same regimental badge. Almost as fierce as these two, the regimental mascot, a small horse called Kruachan, the traditional war cry of the Campbells. Can I come up with you, hmm? Kruachan is said to possess all the characteristics of a typical jock, tough, stocky, fond of a wee drop of something, a wayward temper, and no great respecter of persons. He once had a go at the regiment's colonel-in-chief, Her Majesty the Queen. Thank you. The bar of the sergeant's mess. Back to the old clan system. We were not all from the one clan. We become the old clan. And we're all one big family. And I reckon, uh, if a jock is beside an English battalion in the line, she will fight that bit better, just to prove that he's a Highlander. We have a, we have a, a tougher, tougher private soldier, a, a soldier who is harder to handle. He can only be handled with Scotsman, because uh, he gets his back up as soon as anybody else gets on him. And there is only one man who can handle a Scotsman, that's another Scotsman. <laughs> The joke is on the RSM, who happens to be a Welshman. Jack, <laughs> I, I would, I would honestly, I would honestly an Argyle can be handled by another Argyle. Uh, I, I think I can handle the jokes. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> Well, uh, this has all been gone over before, see. Um, I support him as much a jock as anybody else. Yeah, I am a jock, let's face it. I'm not a Scotsman, but I'm a jock. I'm not uh, sort of getting to the RSM and being a little bit. <laughs> Remember, he's of the same Celtic race. <laughs> the jock, as we know him, is a tough individual. Um, he's hard drinking. He lives hard. He plays hard. Um, he's got an infinite um, pride in his regiment. And although people in this country, when we are sort of stationed in, well, we're stationed in Plymouth, and people tend to think of them as a, just a damn nuisance when they're in the town, these are the people that uh, really do the job when they're in Aden, in Korea, in Cyprus. The Argyles have never claimed to be a band of angels. They accept that if you keep a large body of men at a pitch of fighting readiness over long periods, some of them are likely to get out of hand. One of these three, doing time in the guardroom because he took a swipe at a marine in Plymouth one Saturday night, also shot dead two terrorists in the streets of Aden from a distance of 400 yards. Look at them. Pick it up. It should be clean. Sergeant, get them outside now on the cannon and the bell get them working on that. Thanks, Alan. Right. Ready, have a clean day, Hurry up. Twenty-eight days' detention is the most a commanding officer can give today. For the 19th century soldier, it might have been a thousand lashes. Mark time! Dump, 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 Amongst the Argyles, at least, punishment is given, Straight taken, bell, and forgotten, clean. all in much the same spirit. Number one, you'll clean the bell. Number two and three, you'll clean the cannon. <laughs> Hurry up! 
and perhaps that is just as well. The precise means by which the regiment acquired this bell from Palestine, or this cannon which found its way back from Aden, might not stand too close a scrutiny. These two are spoils of war, and one day they will be laid up in Stirling Castle with all the other treasures of the regiment. 700 Glengarry men Heard the cry come ringing down the glen Oh, Denny, mind the sun Tuck your rifle in your hand The Argyles are moving again Amid sandbags and wire Hit by terrorist fire You will see them With a bayonet on gun Scorched by the sun, you will see them. From the town of Crater is heard the cry. You must learn to live in peace or learn to die. Just to show you that uh, these gimmicks are important and so on, we, for instance, in my regiment, bear our battle honour in our hats, our famous battle honour of the thin red line. And I think if you look closely, you will see that the, the bottom row of those uh, red dice, in fact, join together and, and make a thin red line. Now, that is the sort of gimmick that uh, soldiers, and jocks in particular, uh, will fight for. The action of the 93rd at Balaclava has become a legend. Only two lines of infantry stood between the charging Russian cavalry and the harbour. It was the Times correspondent, William Howard Russell, who first described that thin red streak tipped with a line of steel. But in truth, it wasn't quite like the paintings of the period. The steadiness and accuracy of the Highland fire stopped the Russians 200 yards from the line. Just two men were wounded. The Highlanders had been engaged in a much bloodier battle some weeks before when they stormed the Russian positions on the heights of Alma. The commander, Sir Colin Campbell, warned any man who faltered or stopped to assist the wounded that his name would be posted in his parish church back in Scotland. Sir Colin was still their commander-in-chief when the regiment arrived in India to confront the mutineers at Lucknow. Here were the first fatal cracks in the grand facade of the British Empire. And many, many times in the coming years, this same regiment would be called upon to hold the breach. When the mutineers first saw the kilts of the Highlanders, the rumour spread that Britain had no more men left and were sending women into battle. They won six free seas before breakfast at Lucknow and saved the beleaguered women and children of the residency from massacre. The 91st Argyleshire Highlanders, the older half of the regiment as it is today, served under Wellington in his campaigns against Napoleon. They took part in the famous retreat to Corona before advancing across the Pyrenees into France. The Paris cartoonists, meanwhile, had their own field day. Then in 1852, the troopship Birkenhead struck a rock off the coast of South Africa. Women and children filled the only available boats. The men of the 91st were drawn up on deck and stood fast in silence as the pipes played and the ship went down under them. Over 400 men from Scottish regiments were lost that night. There are those who think that the Argyles should take the disbandment order in the same spirit as the men of the Birkenhead and go down with dignity. But General Macmillan has got his million signatures. Whatever happens to the regiment itself, one company of the Territorial Reserve will carry on. In theory, at least, this little band of Sunday volunteers and a few boys from the town who have heard the call of the pipes could be the nucleus of a new regiment if the call to arms ever came again. But somehow that hope looks rather forlorn. Once the enemy was just across the mountains, then across the water. Today, if he is anywhere, he could be halfway across the world. The 
of the infantryman changes year by year. Rapid movements by helicopter are the product of the Vietnam War. They are vulnerable in the air, but not so vulnerable as a man dangling in the sky beneath his parachute. The last big parachute drop by British troops took place during the Suez invasion of 1956. Some military experts believe that there may never be another, and that the army's remaining parachute battalions have been made obsolete by the helicopter. But for the moment, they are to stay, and the Argyles are to go. It's a technical argument, and it doesn't matter to those who believe that with every regiment that disappears, the world becomes a safer and more civilized place. But no sovereign country has yet succeeded in abolishing its armies. And while he remains, the Scottish infantryman has a fair claim to be among the best the world has ever seen. Routine exercise on Dartmoor offers a chance to watch the Argyles in action. Like wild boar and the cat on their colours, they seem to belong in this environment. But how much of this fighting instinct lies deep inside the nature of man? And how much has been put there by generations of training and tradition? Is it still a noble thing to devote one's life to the arts of death? The lifetime of the regiment has almost exactly matched the lifetime of the bayonet as an effective weapon. Close your eyes! One! Four! Two! Keep it at two! Three! Okay! Four! Okay! Five! Okay! Six! Okay! Seven! Okay! Ten Like all civilians everywhere, the sheep get out of the way as fast as they can. There is not a man here who would not rather be on active service. That is what he trains for, and that means a world where active service is still a possibility. It's a pity that the guts to use a bayonet are not enough. You must have someone else's guts to stick a bayonet in. The objective is taken, and up comes the largest piece of modern infantry equipment, the Wombat anti-tank weapon. Sunday 1968. The band of the Black Watch, the oldest of all Scotland's infantry regiments, leads the parade. The policeman leaves it to the very last minute before bringing modern, peaceful Edinburgh to a halt.
only about 300 people have turned out to watch. It makes a strange and ironic occasion. Regiments that were first raised in loyalty to the German House of Hanover stand to remember the dead of two German wars. A piper plays the lament on the Merkert Cross, who once Prince Charles Edward Stuart proclaimed his revolt. In the turbulent history of Scotland, more than one rebel Highlander has been publicly executed at this very spot. The years can play strange tricks with a man's loyalty. But the dead are forever dead. them who running on that last high place leapt to swift unseen bullets or went up on the hot blast and fury of hell's upsurge or plunged and fell away past this world's verge some say God caught them even before they fell 7,700 Argyles were killed in the first world war and a further 2,000 in the second in the whole history of the regiment more than 72,000 men have been killed or gravely wounded. These, perhaps, are the only ones who know the true meaning of war. After Alamein, the Argyles had the congenial task of rounding up a few thousand of the enemy. Only occasionally did the Second World War develop into the murderous hell of the first. Memory has its own way of obliterating the worst horrors. And occasions like this, when the Mediterranean was warm and blue, and the job in hand a pleasant one, make men look on their wartime days as among the best of their lives. Throughout the course of the war, eight Argyle battalions were spread about the world, sometimes in the forefront of the advance, sometimes sorting out the refugees further back. They made their way through France and Belgium right up to the Rhine. In the early light, the Argyles led the assault on the German occupied bank. But of all the actions the Argyles were engaged in, the one they prized most highly was a retreat. In 1941, the second battalion fought a holding action against the Japanese right down the Malayan Peninsula and across the causeway into Singapore. When the surrender came, all but two of them were either killed or captured. The silver centerpiece, which now stands in the officers' mess, fell into the hands of the Japanese. After the war, it was recovered and reassembled. He's in round the back. Exercise fast ball. I got the signal at 1800 hours and the following details are relevant. Our mission is to evacuate British nationals from a central African country. And we're going to stage at Ascension Island. Now, at this time, I have no further details until I get a briefing a little later on. The operation is secret and is unlikely to be downgraded before we leave. We will take support weapons and we must be prepared to go for up to six months. Let me emphasize that this is an exercise. Uh, don't let's have the wise panicking that we really are all to attention. Uh, Mrs. Logie? Yeah? Uh, tell a couple of your ladies to him, please. The midnight knock on the door, part of a soldier's life. The army owns him 24 hours a day. Uh, exercise, first draw has now begun. Yep, you'll be at a pick-up point at 5.15 tomorrow morning, which is on Muckley Plain. In goes one more jab, this time against Hong Kong flu. Typhus, cholera, yellow fever and smallpox have been pumped in already. The MO makes sure that nothing gets you before the enemy has a chance. 
Does it matter? Yeah. Hold on. Where did you get that? Singapore? From Plymouth. Not bad looking last week. You didn't tempt me to miss, do you? No, sir. <laughs> No more long sea voyages. All troop movements today are done by air. Seven hundred Glengarry men Heard the cry come ringing down the glen Oh, did he mind the sand Tuck your rifle in your hand The Argyles are moving again Right, and if there are no further questions, uh, we have a great deal to do tonight. The sooner we get on with it, the better. Some of these officers fought in Korea. Most of them were in Borneo and Aden. The plaque on the stairs once belonged outside the chartered bank in Crater, before Colonel Colin Mitchell turned it into his battalion headquarters. The previous night, after many bitter and frustrating months, British troops in Aden had at last gone over to the attack. It was like the relief of Lucknow all over again, except that history never sets the same exam questions twice. The Arabs of Crater woke up to find jocks at every street corner dominating the town. We're going to be extremely firm and uh, extremely mean. Uh, these chaps have uh, gunned down British soldiers. Three of my own were killed here. And. Uh, I have no compunction in saying that if some chap now starts throwing grenades or using pistols, we shall kill him, quite rightly. Mad Mitch considered the reoccupation of Crater to be the proudest moment of his soldiering career. Only one Arab had been killed. I think that it did uh, a tremendous amount of, of good for the morale, not only of the army, but of the British nation, uh, that we reoccupied it in the way that we did. And with the... Um, Flamboyance, perhaps that's the word, I don't know. Panache, there's many adjectives. Probably people can think of much ruder ones. The event which most deeply influenced Mitchell's approach to the job happened just before he took command. A mutiny among the Arab police led to the ambush of a mixed patrol of Argyles and Northumberland Fusiliers. In all, 22 British soldiers were killed. And there is evidence that some of them may have been captured alive and later brutally executed. But I personally regard it the circumstances of the 20th of June was utterly disgraceful. I felt myself that we had actually abandoned the place uh, under the most uh, terrible and tragic circumstances to a lot of sort of third-rate, fly-blown chaps. It seemed to me incredibly bad. Mitchell employed techniques which he described as counter-terrorism of a mild but effective sort. His commanding officer, General Philip Tower, required the political temperature kept down and ordered the Argyles to throttle back. And I think if you've got chaps who are embarrassed by having troops who are too good for them to handle, then you should get other chaps to run the show. It seems to me that if you have men who are trained uh, in certain ways and you don't employ them uh, in those ways, uh, that you've missed the whole point of having them in the first place. If you find you've got a situation where you want to employ soldiers, because you can't control it with policemen, then you must employ them uh, as soldiers. You can't bring them in and expect them to perform like constables on the beat in the middle of London. Having admitted that it's a military problem, they must hand it over to the military to carry it out in their way. Within the policy of minimum force, Mitchell, in his own words, resolved to throttle back as little as possible. But when one of his patrols bayoneted a terrorist suspect in the night, orders came down that the Argyles must no longer carry bayonets in the streets. He replied that his men were fighting leopards, not tethered goats. I mean, there's more poppycock and wet tripe talked about the methods that uh, we use in aid than any I've ever heard. A great many Arabs are alive today because we use these. And a great many Argyles are alive today because we use them. And this, to me, is the complete exoneration of, of, uh, of anything. If we needed exonerating, which we don't, never have, never have. A professional soldier cannot choose his enemy. As Britain has gradually abandoned her imperial role, time and again the Argyles have found themselves confronting men fighting for political independence. In India, South Africa, Ireland, Palestine, Cyprus, and finally in Aden. Their story is entwined with the rise and fall of an empire. You can trace it through the ornaments of the officers' mess. 
from this splendid silver Zulu, depicted as a noble warrior and worthy opponent, right down to a cartoon by Jack, catching the mood of Aden. McTavish, put the new Minister of Culture down. Soldiers march along, play it now and play it strong. It's the modern rock of Aden. Come on, laddie, beat your drum to let them know that we are come. Friends will cheer and forward and play the modern rock of Aden. Up the hill and down the glen, the stirring tune will sound again. They will march the highland men to the modern rock of Aden. Up the hill and down the glen, the stirring tune will sound again. us want to go and be bloodthirsty and kill each other or kill other people. On the other hand, that is a profession which we train for, if you like, we are professional killers. Um, and therefore, given the chance, perhaps, you know, if there was a, a chance of staying here or going on active service, I think one would choose active service because that's one's job after all, and we don't often get a chance to do it. I think there was a, a film made about Sandhurst in which the parting shot was a picture of an officer cadet sitting in his room who was asked the question, do you want to go to war? And he replied, every soldier has to have at least one war. It doesn't matter how little. Otherwise, he never thinks he's been a soldier. And I think this is absolutely true. There is no doubt in my mind that you put the jock in a tight spot. And he's a very formidable creature indeed. And if there's any question about pride, his own pride, pride in his regiment, uh, then he reacts pretty viciously if required. Uh, and also, this is a very experienced battalion, and there's no doubt in my mind it's as good as any other, if not better than most. Now, if you take the American army, they would give their eye teeth for even one third of what we've got in the way of regimental spirit and pride. One's whole relationship between the officers' mess, the sergeants' mess, the jocks themselves, all of us together, is something which has been built up because we have all been through hard times and tough times and danger together. There's no question of there being an elite who is exempt from the ordinary, the sweat and the rigors of the day and the unpleasantness whenever the unpleasantness is around. This is something which binds you together very strongly. One has one's own set of values to a large extent. Um, the civilian in long hair and a flowery shirt has got one set of values. He smokes pot and all the rest of it. I wear khaki and a kilt and have a different set of values and, and only smoke cheap cigarettes. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's fair to say that, that either set of values are, are the right ones or the wrong ones from, from that respect. I'm proud of mine, the civilian is presumably proud of his, and I prefer mine to his. My feeling of the single characteristic of the Argyles is pride. We're all very, very proud of being Argyles, and I don't think it matters what happens to us in the future. Um, we know sort of what we've been in the past, we know what we are now. And we don't regret one single thing we've done. And although these men may die, I was not to reason why you will see them. In this fight there is no glory, and death comes by the rules. The lives of Highland soldiers in the hands of English fools. Seven hundred Glengarried men heard the cry come ringing down the glen. Then he mind the sand, tuck your rifle in your hand. The Argyles are moving again. By the end of the month, the Argyles will be in Berlin. They could be just in time for the newest crisis in Europe's most sensitive city. If there are no changes of heart, that will be the last time they will ever leave these shores. At Stirling Castle on St Andrew's Day 1970, as our commanding officer puts it, we shall just take a smart turn to the right and fall out.
no one will be out of a job. A few, especially among the officers, will leave the army with feelings of bitterness at the way their regiment has been treated. The rest will disperse to other units. The Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders will be gone. But they are still hoping. The great petition to save the regiment arrives at Euston Station. There to welcome it is Mad Mitch, the Duchess of Argyle, and Brigadier Ian Stewart. We bring you today from Scotland our petition to Parliament that the disbandment of Scottish regiments and of the Argyle and Southern Highlanders in particular be halted. So we ask only one thing that they be not destroyed. A massive achievement. But petitions, even as big as this one, have a sorry record when it comes to changing the will of government. The party's almost over. But as yet, there are very few signs of despondency amongst the Argyles themselves. With more than a year to go, they cling to the hope that anything might happen. A mutiny, a revolution, or a small war, any sudden bushfire that they, and they alone, have the toughness, professionalism, and experience to put out. Thank you, your next dance please. Right into the middle of the dancers, with bayonets fixed. They're changing the guard on the regimental silver. It represents 175 years of history. And that, plus a handful of memories, is all that may soon be left of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. we've been in the past, we know what we are now, and we don't regret one single thing we've done. <laughs>